Paula from, I think, Portugal, maybe? I still crack up. I mean, I, I love I love your picture. It's not in a million years would I ever thought you look like that. Hey, Andy, I've been asked this question in an interview. What if I hire you and you leave as soon as you find a better paying job? Clearly not my job, but still not sure how to answer. Okay. Or not my dream job. Okay. Stacy, can we fire up? Um, oh, God. <laughs> Jason Jason Garrity's Instagram video. Can we can we get that one about where I I was going on about how you know if your girlfriend jilted you you know do you assume every girlfriend's gonna jilt you? Can you throw that one in the chat for me, please? <laughs> okay, don't mind that little side conversation I was having with Stacy. I have a video out there on just this very subject. This is this is what I would say to anyone who said anything like that to me. Well, let me tell you a few things first. First thing is, I have very, very clearly thought out exactly what I'm looking for. Here's my spreadsheet that Andy gave me. It's got 86 lines on it that tells me everything I need to evaluate. So I know what I'm looking for, and I know what I need to ask you, and I know what information I need to get to know if it's gonna be a great fit for me. And when I make a decision, I'm impatient with my action and I'm patient with my results, meaning I need to get settled in, I need to find my way around the place, I need to put the effort in, I, I wanna make that relationship work, and so on and so forth, and all that good stuff. I would be a little bit more concerned if, right, like if, if you were recruiting and weren't able to tell whether somebody had that level of integrity that I do. And so, like, I would immediately talk about why I was going to make a great decision. And once I make the decision, my word is my bond. Right? I would be going on about that. Like I would just go off on that. Because that's ultimately what they need to understand. That asks them and proves to them that not only will I not be looking, I don't need to look. Because I know I made the good, a good decision and so on. Now, I don't care if this is your dream job or not. You do that anyway. Say that. And it would be, it would be, and, and let me, let me, let me add this on. The, the, the thing about good decision, right? If, if I have all the information that I need, I know I will make an educated decision. I know that I've prepared myself and I know what I need to get. If you are forthright in your information and you're giving me honest answers to my questions, which I'm assuming that you are, then I'm going to be feeling really good. The other thing I know is that you get back what you give off. I am, I'm trusting that you're giving me the right insight and I want you to trust me that I'm giving you the right insight and that we're coming to a, a great decision together. And once I make that decision, I'm about making it work. And then what I would do is I would, if, oh, I would only do this if. If I had a resume that had excellent runs on it, like five, 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 whatever, 10, five, whatever, I'd say, and you can see from my resume that I am a loyal person and I know how to make great decisions, okay? So the last thing I'll leave you with is any time in an interview where a question goes to negative town, okay, any, any negative town, you always talk about what you are, not what you're not, and you don't speculate about bad stuff happening. You highlight how you will mitigate that through what you are doing positively to ensure that it never comes to that okay do not go on about well you know if i if this and if that and if the, you know sky fell and whatever and you know i found it you know somebody called me and recruited don't even go there they would never get that out of me and if they kept saying well well what would you do I'm like i just told you what i would do i would stay right like that that's it end end of discussion but it's about what you are. The same goes to any of you out there where they say, well, have you ever worked with that software before? Now, your first thing that's going through your head is, well, no, no, you dope. It's not on my resume. Why would I, you know, why would you be asking me? You know that I haven't, but you wouldn't say that. You would say, actually, I haven't yet, I've yet had the opportunity to work with that software, but then you talk about what you are but I have worked with this or I have experience with that. And so from those, I could draw the analogy. And whenever I'm faced with something, wherever I haven't done it before, this is how I go about getting up to speed and so on. You're always on the positive side of the equation.
okay? So Paula, that's what I would tell them. That's a terrible, not to you, but I mean, whoever's asking you that stuff, I would be more, they're, they're asking you that stuff because somebody jilted them. So that's why, that, that's why those questions come up and you know that I don't know if Stacy's. I can't. I have no idea where the, where the chat where we are in the chat. But it. I talk about. Do you let your experiences inform you or confine you? They let their experiences confine them, right? So so you want to let your experiences inform you. Amanda C. How do? Interviewer asked, "What is misconception your coworkers have about you, and why wrong?" So. They're asking you to speculate why somebody is misunderstanding you. How would you respond? Uh, P.S. The do you have any reservation clothes has worked so well since I started doing it. Okay. I, I heart you for this one. Okay, I don't do this a lot. This question, people, gold freaking star for this one. All right, so uh, I don't know if y'all were here last week when Marie, my my beloved uh, boot camper from the other side of the pond, asked me a question. We're going to sandwich these up because it's all the same stuff. The interviewer asked her about deal breakers, and it's a negative question. So, so Marie, um, what is it that would be a deal breaker for you in taking this job? They asked in the negative, okay? Amanda's asking... Interviewer asked, what is a misconception your coworkers have about you? They asked, naturally you assume, a negative, okay? Never, under any circumstances ever, answer in the negative. Answer in, what did I say last week? In the omission or a misunderstanding to the positive. So in Marie's case, to recap that one, I said, you focus on something positive about you that would be absent in the future or that's the deal breaker. So in Marie's case, I said to her, you tell them that, well, a deal breaker would be I'm really customer service focused. So if the company that I was joining was not customer service focused, that would be a deal breaker for me. Okay. Amanda, same thing. I'm really a this. Okay. And, and what I've noticed is my coworkers haven't had a chance to experience that at work. So that might be a misconception on their part, but only because they have not had a chance to witness it in me. Follow me? So you talk about a positive trait, the absence of their experience with the positive trait. Every single time you are asked a negative question, you turn it into an omission. In Marie's case, it was, you don't have the trait. Now, you, she didn't say, you are not customer for, customer service focused, right? She didn't, she didn't say that to them, or I hope she didn't say that to them, right? And in Amanda's case, you're not saying that my, my people don't get me. You didn't say that. You don't want to say that, ever. You want to say, they haven't had a chance to see that, so they might not know how funny I am, right? Kind of thing, like, that's the way to go. Y'all, you need to think about this stuff before you go into it, or at a minimum, you need to remember. I don't care. I mean, I've been telling people, just tattoo this stuff on your forearm if you have to. I don't care how you remember it. But like, you know, negative omission, right? Like, I don't care what you do, but you, you've got to be wired to go that route, okay? That is a fantastic question, and it's a wonderful uh, you know, it's, it's a wonderful combination because those questions, Marie's questions about, you know, you have any deal breakers and Amanda's question about misconceptions, all, they're actually, they're pointing you in the direction of a negative, but you don't have to go there. Okay. I hope that helps. And I'm glad about the reservations question. I'm not going to go into that one, uh, here, but if all of you want to know what Amanda is talking about, oh, wait, hang on. The, the, the Hiring Prophecies book is in front of the Interview Intervention book, but let me put the plug in. I give the Interview Intervention book away free. I will ship it to you anywhere in the world uh, for a mere $7, and you will get the hardbound, which is like a $29 book. You get the ebook, which is $8.99 alone on Amazon or you know, the Nooks or iBooks or whatever, uh, and, and you get something that you can get nowhere else. 
because I took my precious time and recorded it for you, the audio book, audio version. Uh, you get all that and you get you get a, an extra ebook, uh, which is actually $27, uh, called How to Interview the Employer, 75 Great Questions to Ask Before You Take Any Job. You'll never run out of questions, ever. Uh, so I would check that out. Maybe Kara can drop that in the chat. Um, and, and in I bring that up because I go into the reservations question on how to close an interview to make sure that there were no misunderstandings during the interview. And reservations come in one of a couple of forms. They either didn't get to investigate something, and because they didn't investigate, they made an assumption that you now don't have the experience because they ran out of time and didn't ask, or they misunderstood something you said, in which case you can now fix it, or it is a reservation and at least you know now that it is a reservation and you can dampen it. But check out the interview intervention book for that. It's a very, very powerful technique to make sure that you you, you don't leave any doubt in their mind uh, or you don't let them walk away with any false assumptions. Amanda, that's a home run, baby. Thank you for that one. Miss Marie, that's a great question. Miss Marie, I'm inserting your question here. Okay, I'll do it at the boot camp too, but I want to tell you because you asked me. So for those of you that have no idea what Miss Marie and I are talking about, she asked a question in the Mile Walk Academy system a couple of days ago. And the question was, she, she was in an interview, or if she gets in an interview, I can't, Marie, I can't remember if it was you were in and they asked, or you, 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 I think, I think you were in and they asked them. And, and they asked about deal breakers for her. So basically, you're getting asked a negative question. Like, what, what could, what would stop you from taking this job? What would stop you from? And it's, it's asked in a negative manner. And my feedback to her was, Anytime you are asked something in the form of a negative, what you need to do is you do not answer in the negative, okay? I'm not, you do not avoid this. You do not answer in the negative. You act, answer in the omission, okay? So follow me. They asked her what her deal breaker was. I said to her, you can insert in, well, it would be a deal breaker for me if the organization was not customer service focused because I am highly nutso about providing great customer service and it would be a deal breaker for me if you were not that. That is the an omission, okay? So now, now what did you just say? Nothing, I'm customer service focused. If you are not, that would be a deal breaker for me. If you did not have good integrity, that would be a deal breaker for me, right? Th these kinds of things. It's a very smart tactic. You never, you will never get trapped. That is a negative. That's a, a negative on you. You ask me for a deal breaker. If you don't do that, right? That's what I would do. And it, and that's a, that's not a terrible question for the employer to ask you, right? They didn't ask you what was your greatest weakness, which is stupid. But Marie, that's a great one. I really appreciate that. Handsome John, that's what I call him. Look at that guy, always smiling. I got stumped today. Question was, what do you not want in your next job? Hmm, took me a minute. What would your best answer to this be? And what was the intent behind this question? Okay, John, love this one, buddy. Mm. Okay. This is a, um, I want to tell you guys, this, you, look, okay, a couple things. You know the question, what's your greatest weakness? And I've, I've shot a video on this. It's out there. You can go check it out. That question is a terrible question for an employer. It's just flat out stupid for so many reasons. It's so stupid. I'm not even going to address why it's so stupid. But employers who ask you what you do not want that's as equally brilliant as the other one is stupid okay and let me let me let me tell you why this is a way to get your immediate reaction of either either one of two things they got a 50 50 shot of getting what they want but they really got a hundred percent shot but this is a disguised what's your greatest weakness okay so Let's take that one first. Think about all the things that you do in your role that you do not want. 
and if maybe you're maybe you're a technologist and you you don't really love the selling part and you don't really want to be involved in you know pre-sales or whatever and you say well i don't want a job that's heavy in pre-sales and blah they're going to immediately know right that, that that's probably a weakness or it's really not something you're good at but at a minimum you don't like it so you're not going to be as great as you could be all right that is a way to flush that out now the other part of that is you may just say well i want to make sure that i'm now it's also a way of saying what do you want in your next job why because you are going to answer all the negatives and then they're going to flip them over so you might say well i don't want a boss who's a micromanagement or a micromanager i don't want a management team who doesn't communicate i don't want an organization who doesn't appreciate its employees and doesn't compensate them annually for blah 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 whatever it is okay so now they're also seeing oh okay well he needs that he needs that he needs that it's another great way to get that information phenomenal question beautiful question really uh, very smart and so that's the intent my answer would have been that now here's how you fool them I want to make sure that I have a job where I get to do a lot of this and this is the skill you're awesome at and the skill they need okay sell to the gap we talked about this I've right of coach John this John so it, it I would want to make sure that any position that I had was not void of that do you see what I just did I gave them nothing I gave them nothing I told them I'm awesome at this you need this my next job better not be void of that and I just told them nothing okay that's the best answer the best answer is you talk about what you want and just say it needs to be present but you but you need to make dang sure that you are saying what is on that job description whatever that is pick the top two things i need a job that does that i need a job that has high customer service contact that allows me to really get in the weeds with the product so anything the thing i would not want is a job that was void of that okay that's how you answer that question all right, buddy, hope, hope that helps. All right, when, um, when you get a question like this, so Parker's asking, how do you answer interview question? What challenges do you see for yourself in the job? What are they looking for? Tips to answer it, thank you. So um, when, when you, this to me, so okay, stretch your ears here, folks. You know that question, what's your greatest weakness? Okay, that, that question sucks, it's stupid, and any employer who asks it doesn't know how to interview. But any interviewer who asks you this question, what challenges do you see for yourself in the job? They know what they're doing, okay? This is an absolute beauty because what this is basically saying or asking you is, where do you think you're gonna struggle? And now they're really getting at it's a great technique for them it really is because because now you're going to start talking about the areas that you're concerned and even if you have some experience in that area it's going to start setting their antennas up so what you what you want to do here is you want to answer in a way well so first off they're looking for the exposure areas right where do you think you're weak that's what they're looking for They've just asked you a better question than what's your greatest weakness right that that's way over in right field and they want you in left field they went right to where they want you to be so what you need to do first thing is i would go watch my greatest weakness uh, uh video and, and 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 look at how i i i suggest answering that what you want to make sure that you're doing is you're talking about something that is unknown to you about the role it's a fair response so what do i mean by this well if you if you if you talk about um the challenges related to something specific that you can see in the job description it's going to look like you don't have the experience but if you point to something that is 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 beyond the scope like 
I'm not really sure. I, I, I would guess one of my biggest challenges would be making sure that we're setting up the right protocols to deal with the outside, to deal with the vendors, to deal with the customers, to deal with the whatever. And I'd want to make sure that all that stuff is in place. So I think the first biggest challenge that I would have is making sure that all that stuff is in order when I get there. Right, this is something that they should have already. And what you're saying is, I don't know how solidly set up you are. Pick anything that's related to, to them, where the onus is on them and not on you. If you say, well, oh, this is an engineering position and I'm a little concerned about you know, how I'm gonna be able to come up with the tactic tactics and techniques to do this, that's going to be a problem. But if you talk about how this integrates with other areas in the organization that are unknown to you, I think that's better. That, that's one of my biggest challenges will be to get up to speed on all that good stuff. So something like that, something that's outside the scope of what's on that piece of paper, that's what I would do so that they can't really hold it against you. Because you don't want them, hold, ultimately here, you just don't want them to hold anything against you. And if you can escape, and that, and I mean that word, I mean, I mean escape, that question, unscathed, you did well, okay? It, usually you're not going to gain a tremendous amount of points with a question like this, but you can lose it. So the, the, the goal here is to just get by it, okay? So I hope that helps. Fantastic question. Hey everybody, it's Andy. Welcome back to my show where I help you build a career you love. Today got a nice little tip for you on job interviewing as it relates to your response to the failure question. So you know the one I'm talking about where they say to you, hey, tell me about a time when you failed at something. And let's just talk about what it is that they're actually looking for. There's really three things that you need to keep in mind as you tell your story. And the major points here are that these three things are what the employer is trying to glean out of the story. The story you tell, the content of the story you tell, is not nearly as important as the context they're trying to grab out of it as they look for these characteristics about you. So let me, let me t tell you what, what I mean by that. When I ask you the failure question, I'm less concerned with what the specific failure was, but I'm more concerned with, first, did you own it? So did you take responsibility or are you the kind of person that's dishing blame? Well, I failed at this because I was given a poor product to maintain, those kind of things. If you fall into the blame game, it's not gonna go well. So the employer is first looking to see, did you own it? Secondly is, what'd you learn? So as I made this mistake, here's what I then discovered. I certainly needed to experience it first in order for me to learn that, but the great thing was, here's what I learned. So the word learned needs to be in there, that's second. And then the third thing is, well, how'd you recover? What was the ultimate outcome? Did you actually bring that story into fruition? So you could have failed at something, but what did you do? Did you just kind of kick it to the side and leave it alone? Or what'd you learn? And then what did you do with what you learned to make it a success or at least recover or address the issue? So I failed when I initially gave this customer something that the customer didn't want. Here's what I learned. And then the recovery was I worked with the customer too. And then what ultimately happened. So did you own it? Did you learn from it? And how did you recover? Now, here's a little bonus tip for you. I think it's nice for you to add your perspective about life. Lots of people are afraid to make mistakes, but I think if you can show them that, hey, I know throughout my career that I am gonna continually encounter things that I don't have experience with, and I think that's a big and positive part of growing, and I think mistakes or these failures, if you want to call them that, are going to be part of the overall learning process. So I embrace those. I'm not afraid of them. We don't want to do them on purpose, obviously, but I think you know, making mistakes, failing at certain things is going to be part of stretching our products, our services, and the other things that we bring forward to our teams and our communities and our customers. So that's my perspective on that. And so I think if you wrap wrap, wrap the end of your story with something like that, it puts a nice little bow on it. So I hope you enjoyed this tip. There's lots more job interviewing tips on the playlist on my YouTube channel. I also have a job interviewing webinar called Three Keys to Ace Any Job Interview. I hope you enjoy those and make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'm live every Tuesday and Thursdays. On Tuesdays, I have careers and coffee in the morning. 
at 7 a.m. Central Time, and on Thursdays I'm live with my live office hours at 11 a.m. Central Time. Hope you can join me for those. Till next week, take care. Sanjitha, my boot camper, I am asked to email, how would you describe your ability to be a team player uh, when confirming for a Skype interview next week? Tips, please. Let's get this up here. All right, team player. This is, uh, I'm gonna give you a multi-use response. So if, if somebody wants to know uh, an example of when you were a team player, if somebody wants to know an example of when you disagreed with somebody on your team, okay, so disagreement. If somebody wants to know how did you work toward a common goal when you had other playmates or other pieces or when you were part of a team or whatever, any variation of this, the response I'm about to give you is the one you need, okay? Now, what do teams do? Always start with the end in mind, right, Stephen Covey? Well, teammates work together to achieve a common goal, okay? So you can describe any time where you were working with other parties. So my philosophy or my example should include, and by the way, uh, I, have a, I have a video out there on how to answer behavioral interview questions. You should, you should check that out. Now, I'm not gonna go into all the stuff, but it talks about explaining your philosophy, then explaining your process, and then explaining the outcome that occurred. It's, in my opinion, the best way to answer a behavioral interviewing question of which this is one. So the way I am a team player or my ability to be a team player is because I'm always focusing on the common and greater goal that the team has. And what this does for me is it allows me to work well with others because regardless of the varying viewpoints that we have, I always like to work to focus all of us on the common goal. So if ever we're in a situation I want to where I can I can I'm working with others, I want to look at it from whatever standpoint I am, whether I'm the leader or whether I'm part of the team is are, are we assembled correctly? Is everybody focusing on what they can and contributing based on their skills? Are we complementing each other? And then if we ever, and, and if we are, that's great. And that's an easy way to be a team player. But being a great team player and what I always want you all to share with an employer is it's great when everybody loves each other, right? And, every, and the team is designed perfectly because the big boss designed it perfectly. Right, we've got player A, B, C, D. None of it's overlapping. Everybody's got their their lane that they swim in, and they're all working together. Well, that's easy to be a team player when the, when the team was chosen correctly, and when everybody is playing to their strengths. When do we run into problems? This is what you want to get into the answer. We run into problems when teammates start disagreeing. Okay, so when people disagree, the best thing a, a team player can do is to step back, listen to the other party. Think about, is there a way that based on your viewpoint, your opinion, my viewpoint, my opinion, that we can look at developing a solution, developing a process, developing a product, serving a customer, whatever the goal of the team is, that accommodates for the input of all parties in alignment with the common goal, okay? Because what happens is, I don't like you. You're irritating me. You're not carrying your weight. You're, this, is, this is where we have problems, right? So I don't focus on that. I try to bring my attention and everybody else's attention to the common goal. And what that does is it helps everybody focus on what they should be focusing on. Not the fact that Sanjita brought this up and I don't, I don't like her opinion and because she's not nice to me or something like that. That, that. This is the kind of stuff that happens, right? This is what makes disagreements. This is what makes teams not move with the speed and, and deliverability that they can. So I like to focus the team and all its players on the, on the common goal and work our solutions, our efforts, our whatever toward that common goal. That is the best answer. No one will ever fault you from that. And how many different characteristics did you just work into that response? I'm a team player. I'm level-headed. I'm a great listener and I allow time for others to share with me and I share with them. And I always make sure that I'm looking at the big picture. So I'm a big picture thinker. I could go on all day about this.
This is the stuff that people don't do. They don't think about it. They're looking for example. So the best story to substantiate that was is let me tell you about a time when, right? Let me tell you about a time when I was working on this team and we were working toward this common goal. And we had this issue, and I and one of the team members had varying, you don't have to say disagree, varying viewpoints about how we were going to do this. So we listened to each other. Um, we kept focusing on the common goal. And it turns out that we were able to come up with a solution that melded our two opinions together to have an even better solution. That's the ultimate response. That's the ultimate story, okay, where you had a disagreement, and then you listened, and then you combined it for the greater good. There's no better story than that. The story where you influence somebody else to do what you wanted talks about your influencing skills, doesn't talk about your team player skills, right? So, so that's, that's how I would look at that. Now, you can write that up. You could, you could replay this all you want. You can take you know, my, my role play and my non-role play mixtures and you can kind of cut and copy and, 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 and put it together. But I think, I think that is the way to go on team player. Believe me, that's... There ain't nobody in the world that isn't going to love that. Okay, good luck with that. Raphael, interview question I had and wasn't sure how to answer. As a remote manager, how do you keep your team engaged and connected? Okay. So, this is a great question because anytime they ask you a how, how do you, the important thing is for you to share your philosophy here because, because what? What I would say is, to me, it's my experience that it isn't about the distance between you that determines connection, the geographical distance, the physical distance, right? You could be standing, can I get a hey? You could be standing in the same room with somebody and feel totally alone. And you could be, right, millions of miles apart and be totally connected. Right? You figure out how you want to say this. Wait, just because you're in the same room with somebody doesn't mean you're connected. And just because there's a distance doesn't mean, right? You can be connected. Knowing this, if this is a remote job, some best practices for keeping the team connected are, and then list. Okay? So it's about communication. It is, you know, real time if it's if it's not inefficient like a slack channel whatever and making sure that right people are they understand access, accessible hours things like that when 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 I'm highly available and so on there's communication enough group dynamics meetings status making sure everybody's got their you know their their marching orders and so on and then there's the one on one contact and so on and you just go through it and then and then whenever somebody needs a little bit more attention Right, you go through the process. What? So when I give you a how-to, think about any th time you watch me. Why do I want you to? What do I want you to do? Why do I want you to do it? What mistake don't I want you to make? How to avoid it? Right? You always get those. And sometimes it's some sequence. Sometimes it's different sequences. But that you always want to include that. So then you want to talk about how you're getting engaged and what you're doing and so on. You got this, man. Vibe Hav? Hey, Andy, eagerly waiting to hear live. I'm here. I'm here, my man. Uh, can you please throw some light on how one should answer questions like, what are the biggest professional challenge you faced? Okay. Now, one of the things that I would, um, one of the things that I would say here, uh, professional challenge is, I am the type of person, whenever cornered and have to choose something in the negative, meaning a challenge is an obstacle I had to overcome. Now, that's actually a positive because, right, if I want to grow, I have to overcome the challenge. So the biggest professional challenge I faced could be any number of things. But it, in, in many cases, when I'm asked about a negative, I answer with an omission, meaning I haven't yet had the opportunity to do this. In this particular case, in this particular case, when they're asking about the biggest professional challenge that you faced, you need to pick something that you overcome, overcame and show how the best answer is something you overcame, something you overcame, 
why it changed your life and your attitude about everything else that you do, right? And then how you continually work at it each day. Those are the three magical components in something like that. Okay, so if, if you asked me, Andy, what was the biggest professional challenge you ever faced? I would say to you, I made a commitment to become a trainer in this format. So I basically stopped what I was doing, not technically, but I, 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 I decided I was going to stop being a full-time executive recruiter and I was going to take on becoming a full-time coach and trainer. And in doing so, that was the most difficult challenge that I, I, had, to, I had to face because I could list it all out. And the reason that I never quit, and this is the biggest reason why most people don't have what they want in their lives, is because they don't have a powerful enough reason or a why to drive them through the most difficult challenges. And then it becomes a tactical component, except that you making a change in your life. I'm talking about whatever professional challenge this was because it had to be a change that you overcame. Change is never a function of ability, okay, ever. Change is a function of emotion and drive and reasons why, okay? So you need to draw the distinction. I will never quit you. Why? Because my reasons are so dialed in that on days I want to cry, I won't because you need me. I made a commitment. My reasons will trump anything. I will always be able to figure it out given enough time. So you pick something where you can wrap all that together and that's how I would do it. People, you gotta remember this. And as a total side, change is never a function of ability. Improvement is never a function of ability. It is a function of emotion. Right? It is a function of drive. It is a function of reason. Okay? Given enough time, if your reasons are solid enough, if the necessity is there, you'll do it. If it isn't, you won't. What do I also say to you? Anytime you fail at something or you didn't reach your goal, the only question you need to ask yourself is what was I unwilling to do? Right? I did not have solid enough reasons that caused me to reach a stopping point. Right? I didn't want to give that up. I didn't want to give up my life of ease. I didn't want to take on the hardship. I was nervous. I didn't want to take the loan out. I didn't want to go into debt. I didn't want to spend the seven years in school. I didn't want to whatever. There was something that you weren't willing to do. That's it. Figure out what that is. Figure out if you're willing to get through it. You'll be fine. All right. I hope you enjoyed that. Near my, what is the best way to articulate an answer to the question, how do you promote diversity as a leader of the group, I love this. Okay, so leaders build more leaders, they don't build more followers. The best leaders figure out how to manage an entire team by maximizing the individual performances of the people on the team because everybody is incented, and I'm not talking about dollars and cents, but yeah, those two, incented differently, motivated differently, cares about different stuff. There's two people on the team and both of these people, while they might be the senior analyst on the team, this one cares about career advancement and this one cares about work-life balance. This one cares about more money and this one cares about title. Everybody's motivated differently and that's okay. All right? So when I talk about promoting diversity, I do a couple of things. As I'm looking to, there's now, diversity could mean different things to different people. It could mean different uh, different nationalities, backgrounds, uh, and experiences, and demographics, right? All different kinds of people that walk this, this earth. It could be diversity of ideas from different individuals on the team, all right? So what I'm a proponent of, and I did this as I would build teams as a consultant, I managed very large groups. And what I would always uh, do with the staffing uh, unit who would help me get the resources for my team is I would say to them, uh, it's more, it's very important to me that we have diversity of all kinds, meaning I need men and women. I don't need 10 men and a woman, and I don't want 11 women and a guy, right? Kind of thing. So I like a mix because men and women think differently. They just do. That's okay. I don't think there's anything wrong with that statement. We do. 
care about different things, we think differently, we come from different backgrounds. I would also like people from different schools, backgrounds, whatever. I don't want tenant electrical engineers. I want, I need business people, I need whatever. Give, try to make that diverse. Also, if we have um, minorities, different cultures, other, other uh, individuals where we can create a very eclectic group, uh, I don't care that each of them is motivated by different things because as the leader, it's my job to actually engage with the individual, understand what the individual's motivations, interests are, and so forth, and then manage them individually through a series of processes that's put together. Everybody has the protocols that they need to operate within, except that from a motivation standpoint, you need to treat each of them individually, interact with them individually to understand how to elevate their game because when they're all maximizing their performance, the team is going to be even greater. Okay, so so from a, from a uh, I don't want to use the word recruitment, but basically when you're assembling that team, there's considerations. When you look at, at tr interacting with them, uh, it, diverse doesn't just mean different types of people, different kinds of ideas. It also means in how you interact with them. You need to be nimble. Okay, I'm not talking about preferential treatment. I'm talking about doing what you need to do to maximize that person's enjoyment and performance. Okay, so I mean, you know, I could I could have cut this thing off in 10 seconds and just said, well, I could just quote a system, the thing, and just pluck, you know, X number of people that I need. But I don't, I, I think that's very short-sighted, and I also don't think that that is to the spirit of what you really are looking for. Diversity comes in all kinds, from all kinds of different directions, and it, it's not just you know, we need a diverse group of people. There's diversity in how we're going to think, how we're going to create, how we're going to innovate, and all that stuff too. I mean, I go on all day about this one.